Hey, Devoted Nation, this is the second installment of the Land BS series of the Devoted Outdoorsman's podcast. I hope you guys are ready for this week's podcast. Me and Josh have already been kind of goofing off all night, and uh, we're ready to get this thing started. So this week on the podcast, we are going to talk about goals, our goals for the land or our property that we hunt on for uh, the 2018 season. Yeah, starting off with one of the main things being is, you know, food plots and where we need to put them, how many we need to do, you know, acreage size, you know, what to plant, you know, kind of just getting an idea of planting for later in the season. So what we're going to talk about first, I do believe, is we're going to talk a little bit about uh, our food plot plans and then we're going to get into a little bit about minerals and feeders. So... Uh, the plans we have for the food plot right now are we're gonna start in uh, what do we what do we say earlier? We decided on you know kind of end of April, early May, going into coming out of spring, getting ready to go into summer. Well, and that transition time between uh, you know spring and summer a little bit there. We're gonna go in and uh, find the areas that we decide on that we're gonna put our food plots in, and we're gonna take some weed eaters in. We're gonna do this most of it by hand. Maybe we might get some help from a tractor or something. We're not real sure yet. But we're going to try and uh, do most of it by hand because that's the cheapest way and that's what we're about. The cheapest way. So. Most economical for yeah, the e- common hunter. The everyday guy that we are. The blue collar. <laughs> so what we're going to do is uh, the kind of the plan we got right now is we're going to go in with uh, lawn mowers and weed eaters and cut out um, either half acre or quarter acre section areas where we're going to make these food plots. You know, give or take a little bit, but uh, something around that size. And uh, we're going to go in in May, what did we say? End of April, you know, kind of going into May. End of April or the beginning of May and go ahead and cut these areas out and get everything ready. Yeah, I mean, going in, just finding, you know, the exact area, deciding. Because like you said, you know, we're talking about looking at half acre, quarter acre size, you know. Not having to, wanting to dump a ton of money into this and kind of just see how it plays out the first year you know, what the results are and hopefully help get something established and then build off of it the next year or so. But going in, starting out, doing a lot of hand work, kind of just getting everything cut down early, kind of just, you know, roughing out where we're wanting to do this. Yeah, that way when we go in in uh, August or September, we don't have to go in and start all from a blank slate, basically. We can go in and already have kind of everything set up the way we want. At least a little bit. That way we're not chopping down weeds that are like six feet tall or anything like that. Yeah, kind of just make it a little easier for us. A little less work. Just kind of go in and maybe have to do just some fresh cleanup. Get everything down and going through and start looking into getting ready to plant. Also, at the end of April, the beginning of May, we're going to also set up our food plot, or not our food plots, our mineral sites and our trail cameras for the uh, summertime. Just so we can kind of start seeing what deer are kind of using the property. You know, ne- not necessarily to know exactly what bucks are there yet, just to kind of see what's going on. Yeah, try to find travel corridors, you know, favorite feeding areas, you know, times and stuff of which they're moving at that point, how the temperature and the weather is affecting them. Whether they're up early in the morning doing stuff, you know, way out there in the middle of the night, or if they're even possibly coming out, you know, somewhat closer to midday and feeding and being active. Just trying to kind of get a better idea of what their activity is like at this time of the year. And, you know, to draw them into these areas where we're going to uh, end up planting our food plots and just kind of making it like a feeding area, you know. Um, we're going to set up uh, feeders, our mineral sites, on the same places that we're going to do our food plots. So that way the deer kind of know that the food's there all year. Yeah, kind of just get them you know, comfortable and transition to do coming out and getting used to that area. And kind of trying to create a flow to get them down and running up and down through that whole area that we set the line, the camera line and everything. So like we said, we're going to go in with uh, weed eaters and a mower. We're going to come back towards the end of summer and uh, weed eat again as far down, down to the dirt, and uh, go ahead and spray some type of uh, pesticide, not pesticide, herbicide in there and see what we can uh, get started. Also, we're going to be uh, trimming our stand setups. Yeah, like you said, you know, going through, trying to figure out now that you know most of the stuff's got its leaves on it and you can see what actually is going to be in your way at that point when it comes into early season for bow hunting. Get up in there, maybe get a stand set up in there, just figure out how high we're going to go. See what limbs and you know branches could be in the way, what some you're wanting to leave for you know help with cover. Just kind of going through and getting a 
you know, boots on the ground, eyes out on it, and seeing exactly what you're going to be seeing when it comes closer to that time. So we kind of jumped ahead there. That's my fault. You know, it's always my fault. I always jump ahead. But the minerals that we're going to be using this year, I think we're going to stick with Trophy Rock because um, we believe in that product and we really like it. We know the deer use it a lot. And we might also throw out like one of those, uh, you know, like cattle salt licks just to see, you know, the comp- comparison to see if the deer use both of them or if one is um, more preferred. More preferred. Yeah, like, you know, we, like you said, we believe in that product of Trophy Rock. I mean, we've used that for years now. And even kind of branching off of just the rock itself and getting into the 465, which is just the ground up version of that. And seeing the benefits it's played, you know, in food plots and small areas where we've tested it down and seen not just, you know, the deer getting the minerals, but the plants as well and helping that build up. But yeah, like you said, you know, even getting some of the salt blocks out there and just seeing what they're preferring and, you know, what works out better for cost effectiveness as well. And then I think later on in the summer, probably when we go in and actually plant the food plots is when we'll actually start feeding corn in the feeders. I don't think we'll feed it all summer because like we said in the previous podcast, part of this property is like probably an 80 acre soybean field. So they're not necessarily at a lack of food at this point in year. No, not at all. I mean, and the thing we've run into here in the past is you drop a bag of corn down and you go check the camera a week later and that corn was gone within 24 hours or less. And so, you know, being average Joes and working class guys, we can't really just afford to go drop a ton of corn out all the time. But we could just start buying it by the truckload (laughs) and uh, store it in your garage. Yeah, that'll fly. But, you know, like you said, we can try to find out the most cost effective ways to, you know, benefit us with how we're going to, you know, one, provide corn or, you know, even food plots, you know, just trying to find a method that works easier for us budget wise and maybe even helps you guys out with figuring budgets and stuff and being able to find something that works better for lower with how am i wanting to put this lower cost effective with uh your hunting property and stuff or you can just laugh at us too because that's cool (laughs) you could (laughs) so going forward from there um we kind of been talking about sand stand locations uh there's a couple uh permanent stands that have been built on the property so we're going to go in this summer and uh, do a little bit of touch-up work on those as well Um, one of them needs a ladder rebuilt Um, another one needs to be connected back to the tree because josh broke it and uh, there's a couple other trees that we're going to just trim up and get everything ready for the season i think we discussed going in and putting um, the stands in in late july early august and or late june early july just to kind of get the stands in there. That way the deer can get used to them being in the in the positions that they're going to be in for the rest of the year. Yeah, for sure. And like you said, you know, talking about those stands that are permanently there, like going through and it's not just so much cleaning them up and everything, but it's trying to get them reestablished and, you know, set up and ready to go firm, solid. That way we're not getting up there and falling out of the tree like idiots we've done before. But even, like, you know, you mentioned we're talking about June, July, maybe even early August getting the stand set up. Just so that, you know, they get to where they've absorbed some of the scent of the surrounding area. And like you said, the deer walk by it, see it, get accustomed to it. They're not freaked out by it. Make it a little easier on us to be able to get in and them not easily be freaked out by something up in the tree. You know what I was thinking, man, is we should get some, like, mannequins. We could do that. And stick them in there. That way the deer always think that there's people in there. Dress them up like us. So when they walk by and we're in there, they're just going to think that that's normal. You realize we do that. we got to give them names. What are we going to name the mannequins? I don't know yet. Maybe we could let the devoted nation decide that. First off, where are we going to get mannequins from? Well, I got ways. We can find them. I, th- I got connections. You think the mall has any extra mannequins? Oh, for sure. Some like for Ab- sure. Some like Abercrombie and Fitch, like stinky we could. mannequins. <laughs> get some of them stank up in there. So, with that being said, let's move into kind of... We have to get some new stands this year because in previous years, uh, I've been using a bunch of climbing stands and, and this property, I'm not saying that those necessarily won't work. It's just, it's not a good idea to have, you know, take down a stand in one position and then have to take it to the next one 
the next time you want to hunt. So what we're going to do is we're going to get some like strap-on stands and a couple ladder stands to set up in different positions across the property. That way we're not having to tear down and set up every time. Yeah, and I mean, not to say we're not going to use climbing stands. I mean, there's still several areas we're going to be moving them around a little bit, but get some more established stands and stuff. A little easier set up. Some of them easier to get to. Even some buddy stands, you know, take the wives or the kids out and get them, you know, more involved in it. But just trying to find, you know, different types and more um, long-term setup for stands in the positions I'll be in. So, and I'm not saying that uh, I won't be doing run and gun setups, which I'm sure I will throughout the year um, because everybody knows I'm a public land guy. I love public land. There's so much of it and I want to hunt all of it. So, shoot, some yeah. of our best hunts have been run and gun setups. Exactly. Do a lot of them have been. Like that one where you harvested your first bow kill. Oh, yeah. Completely, you know, one plan went out the window and the next one started. Quick move on the fly, find it, set up, or. Wait. Or even like that hunt I had here in December where I was on vacation. I got this wild hair to go out to some public land I'd never been to before. And, you know, I just set up on a field and I actually ended up seeing 11 deer that night. So I gave it a day, came back the ne- or came back two days later, set up on a different side of the field in a tree that took me uh, like a good 45 minutes to figure out a way to get up into it because it had limbs coming out of like all sides So it's kind of hard to climb that with a climbing stand. Plus, in the state of Oklahoma, on core or public land, um, you're not allowed to uh, cut the trees, like cut limbs and stuff off of them. So it was kind of a difficult setup. But once I did get set up, the deer actually ended up coming within uh, 25 yards. I just never got a very clear shot. And when I did, I I ended up missing. Uh, I'm not sure if I hit a limb or what happened, but... You know, it was it was all still a good hunt. You know, gave me some uh, good information about that land that maybe I can use next year. Insight on to go back out there and what places to set up on more specifically for you. Yeah, but I'm definitely not going to set up in that tree next time, <laughs> dude. Like I looked, so let's say it's probably it's two fields, so it's like a like a like an hourglass, you yeah. know. And in the middle, there's this pinch. So in this pinch is where I set up the first time because I thought, you know, this is where the deer are going to come through. You know, they're going to kind of funnel out and they're going to come in through here. Didn't happen that way. The deer decided to come out on the other side of the field where it's big open. I was like, you know, all right, I'll find a tree over there. So that night when I went in to set up the second time, I kind of cruised around that side of the field for a good like 45 minutes trying to find a tree that wasn't this one. And uh, I ended up just setting up in it anyways it, I mean, it was a very uncomfortable tree to sit in. I'm not going to lie. But uh, my API climbing stand made a easy enough job out of getting up in it. It was just very uncomfortable. But it did lead to a successful hunt, and uh, I got a little bit of that on video if you guys want to check that out on the Facebook page. Yeah. So now something else we got to look into is um, are we going to do any blinds this year? Uh, there has been... <clears throat> some talk of uh, possibly building a blind. Um, Josh is talking about building a blind that might probably end up being like something that's permanent. So we're not really sure like what we're going to build yet, but you know, we'll, we'll figure something out and you know, I might just have Josh set up in a cardboard box. It could, it could happen, but you know, trying to look at it, you know, long-term for us is, you know, we do have our dads coming out, my grandpa talking about wanting to come out. So trying to find something for, you know, the old men to get up and be able to be a little more comfortable and possibly put a heater in there with them. Or even just to get the kids or our wives out because, you know, it's <clears throat> hard It's hard to be leaving uh, your family all the time throughout the year to go hunt. And, you know, if you can get your kids and your wives involved, it helps out tremendously because now everyone's having fun doing something that you love. Yeah, spending more quality time together. Plus, you're getting everyone involved in something that the whole family can get out and enjoy together and gets everybody outdoors and experiencing nature and what all it has to offer so i think i have a i believe it is a double bull blind that we might be using out there i'm not really sure i like to use that on uh, some public land that i hunt but uh, we might end up just setting that out there on one of these pond dams that i i like a little bit and uh seeing how that works out But other than that, um, I think we might end up purchasing a couple more, you know, just like portable blinds. That way we can get those set up in areas that uh, you necessarily can't uh, climb in a tree. 
Yeah, and kind of figure out, you know, what's going to be the best access point, vantage point from those, and be able to move, make them a little bit mobile, be a little bit better for us, be able to get the kids or even, like we said, our wives, you know, maybe a possible better chance at harvesting a deer. Yeah, and in the in the summertime, you know, as it goes into October, which is when uh, deer season opens up here in Oklahoma, archery season opens October 1st, the soybeans are pretty tall, so... If there might be a little area on the side of this soybean field where we see deer are entering from uh, one of our other stand setups, that we might want to sneak in with a blind, one of our portable blinds, and get set up on these deer. Yeah, for sure. So, moving on, you know, with we've talked about blind stands, you know, we're now coming into summer, working into, coming into fall, getting ready for the final setup on everything with, you know, archery season opening up. What are we going to plant in our food plots? Dude, I'm definitely thinking uh, winter wheat because it's very cost efficient and um, any, it grows anywhere. Like um, I, I'm pretty sure you can just throw it on some concrete, give it a little bit of water, it'll, it'll and it'll grow. it'll grow for a little bit. But uh, that's the, that's all it needs to do is turn green for a little bit so the deer will come over. Yeah, for sure. Something else we've even you know we were talking about earlier is even looking to do like some chicory down in there as well. We've had some success with that in the past. Yeah, no doubt. The chicory is a, a good idea, and that's probably something that we will end up uh, investing in. Just depends on what type of what how, what the price is like on that. But I know that the winter wheat you can get like a 50, 50 pound bag of winter wheat for like fifteen dollars at um, one of the co- local co ops. So I think we're gonna go ahead and pick some of that up, and that will be something that's definitely in our food plots. Plus, once they cut the soybeans out, there's not a lot of food in that area. So I think just that little bit of uh, you know nutrition will ha- be enough to draw some of these deer in on the cold nights. Yeah, for sure. Because I mean, like you said, you know, going through with all that, and then coming into that time of hunting in the mid midway through the start of archery season, you know, they tend to cut the beans down. So trying to get something green and keep them drawn out or whatever. But, um, yeah, so now, like you said, you know, we're in there, we're planting and everything going through. Now we're really going through and trying to set up, you know, find more of our portable stand locations that we're going to set up on and with the climbers, try to figure out some easier route to get to our favorite tree that we've picked out. Because like we've said, you know, in the last podcast, this area is, if you start getting into some of the timber, it's not very forgiving on being passable through. It's very thick, very tall. So just trying to find a clearer path that's got doesn't really intercept with blowing scent and stuff up a, a highway trail or something for the deer. Dude, when's your son due? <laughs> that's the funny part is he's actually due on the fourth of July. So the whole country will be celebrating his birthday. I know. I'm kind of excited. I said I need a window with a big wide view so I get plenty of fireworks in the view so I can hold him up and look. Do like the whole Lion King thing. So when we, uh, let's kind of go back for a second, when we go out in April or uh, early May and set out our um, our mineral setups and kind of trim our food plots, we are going to be setting out our Tasco trail cameras, man, and hopefully, hopefully, some of our deer start showing up on there. Hopefully. I mean, we like we said in the last podcast, we've got a couple pictures of one buck who are almost for sure is Buster. Still hoping that we, with a camera, another camera I set up this last week, that we're hoping we maybe get a full body shot and be able to identify it a little further, him a little further. But yeah, for sure, using these Tasco cameras, being able to set them up and everything, the affordability of the camera is one of the most, the biggest draws for me with them because I've always wanted as many trail cameras as I could put up and everything. But I'm also not really willing to go drop, you know, 180, 250 bucks on a camera at the drop of a hat. Or if you want to buy a Reconyx, I think they're like four fifty, dude. Yes, no, they're even higher than that. That's crazy. I know, and I think some people have like a like forty of those cameras, and half of them are the cellular. I could have like twenty Tascos. I know that's what I'm saying. <laughs> and with it being you know reliable, six months worth of battery life off of eight double A's compared to our old cameras that were four C's. Which I was very skeptical of when we first got them. You know, I kind of heard of it, heard of them from uh, someone this summer. And they were like, hey, man, have you checked out those cameras at Walmart? And I was like, what cameras? $25. I mean, that can't be a very good camera. And everyone, you know, he was like, man, I bought one. You know, it's 25 bucks. If it works, it works. If it's not, it's, you know, whatever, 25 bucks. I was like, all right. You know, I do a lot of public land hunting like we've discussed. And 
I was like, man, all right, I'm gonna go buy a couple. So I went in, went up to Walmart. Sure enough, 25 bucks, bought two of them. You know, I had I had my doubts. I got them out of the package. I checked them out. You know, they were pretty decent quality. Um, and if you guys want to, you guys can go on to the Devoted Outdoorsman's YouTube page and check out uh, the reviews that we have done on the Tasco Trail cameras. Uh, one of those is from the day that I bought it. You know, it's just kind of my thoughts on the camera uh, at first glance, the packaging and everything like that. But like I was saying, I was very skeptical at first. You know, $25, of course, I think it's going to eat batteries. And uh, what if it just doesn't take pictures? Because I've had that problem in the past. Well, you know, went and set it out. And then Josh, you know, Josh said, hey, man, I'm going to go buy some too. Josh ended up going buy a couple as well. We set them all out. Worked phenomenal. I set one out in September on uh, some public land. And, you know, on a creek. Which, I mean, I don't know what my habit is of putting cameras in places where it's potential for them to... How high up did you have that camera, too? Because that was uh, kind of up there. Like three feet, four feet. Like, it wasn't very... You know, uh, it I mean, looked like it was higher than that. It was in a creek, though. That's true. So it's like, you know, it dips down. Like, there's a pretty good drop right there. But, you know, I got a lot of pictures of hogs, some uh, pictures of some bobcats. Not necessarily what I was looking for. Um, this area is um, it's way back in there. It's very secluded. So last year, my younger brother, Andrew... So this would have been the 2016 season. Uh, my little brother, he caught eyes. He got his eyes on a buck that he says he thinks would uh, would hit like the 180 range. Which you can't necessarily believe everything Andrew says, but if he says something that big, it, it was probably you know like a 140, and that's a decent deer for public land, and that's something that I'm after. So that's the reason I was kind of pushed into this creek area to uh, set up this camera in the summer just to see what was going on. I ended up not actually ever getting any pictures of that deer or actually even seeing that deer. I saw a bunch of does. I saw one little basket rack, eight, and I saw a bunch of hogs. Uh, I mean, crazy amounts of hogs. And Andrew, my younger brother, uh, he hunted not too far away from me. He ended up um, not actually harvesting a deer or even getting a deer within range out there this year. But my dad, uh, he ended up harvesting uh, two deer. He ended up harvesting a little a little buck and a doe uh, on the same day. Probably about 100 yards from where I was set up out on the same creek system. Which, you know, public land, I think we did pretty good. I would call that a successful year out there. Oh, shoot. Very successful year. Moving forward from that, we were talking about the, the Tasco cameras, though. Um, the battery life, man, you know, that was something that I was very surprised with. Like I said, I set that camera up in September, you know, got lots of pictures, lots of pictures. I bet there was I bet there was a thousand pictures on that card when I went to pull that camera. And, you know, I was very surprised that it still had battery life. I went in there expecting the camera to be completely dead, had died um, at some point, you know, maybe a weekend. Like, that's really what my expectations of this camera were. But it ended up being that I, I had that same set of batteries in that camera from September, like, 14th to, um, I think, January. And they might even been, the, I'm not really sure, but they might even been the same set of batteries that we had in the camera on the pond. Yeah, I mean. And that, that, was, in fe- that was in February. That was. And then it set for a month because you just went and checked it in March. Yeah. So what is that? That's like September, October, November, December, <sighs> January, like February. Seven, months. That's seven months. Yeah. Seven months on the same set of batteries. And it was it charged? Did it sell battery life when oh, you went? It still had plenty of life to it. I mean, the LCD screen was still like bright and vibrant. Like you just put fresh batteries in it. So I really want to know how long is this one set of batteries is going to last? What if it goes a year? If it goes a year, dude, I'm not going to lie. I'm going to go buy every camera they got at Walmart. If it goes a year, you buy batteries for the next year. Fair enough. That's fair enough. No, nah, but you know, you talk about the battery life on these and you know, I was excited because, you know, it was an affordable camera. So I went out and, like you said, I bought two of them, set them up out there and was impressed unbelievably because I just even pulled my car, or my cameras out and was going to set one of them out on a different spot trying to watch the little crossing section. And I haven't even exchanged the batteries in it yet. And, I mean, I set, I put batteries in that in August. And so, I mean, I'm going on seven and a half, eight months with it. I mean, they're still working, so reliability of the battery life with these cameras i am unbelievably you know on board with this stuff 
you just got to remember not to put the camera in aim mode and leave it on for a month so you don't burn batteries up in a month like I did the first try. Yeah, because that does happen. Like, uh, I've had a lot of people actually email me and uh, get in contact with me about the YouTube videos, trying to figure out the exact process of how to get the camera set up. You know, because the owner's manual isn't necessarily um, very uh, descriptive. Like, you know, it tells you how to do it, but if... Very vaguely. Very vaguely, yeah. You know, it tells you to flip this switch and do this. So if you guys have this Tasco camera and have any questions, just hit us up and uh, I'll see if I can help you out. But, um, you know, I also have, there's a 6 megapixel and there's an 8 megapixel. I have two of the 6 megapixels that I've one of the 8s that my wife actually got me for... It was Christmas. For Christmas, yeah. For Christmas she got me the 8 megapixel. And the 8 megapixel actually is a, um, you know, it's a little bit different design, but it's the same platform um i haven't really controls and everything yeah same controls and everything and i haven't really like compared pictures or anything but surprisingly for a 25 five dollar camera the pictures aren't that bad i was unbelievably impressed because the first camera i put up i you know overly anxiously set it up to take just as many pictures as it possibly could and we ended up with almost ten thousand pictures but dude it was more than that that (laughs) one camera had like sixteen thousand pictures on it yeah it was like sixteen thousand we learned our lesson there but just, I mean, from having other cameras in the past and stuff and, you know, mm-hmm. kind of expecting, you know, kind of grainy or not really vibrant in color, trying to just pick out shadows to distinguish day from night. I was impressed with the fact that I'm looking at it and it's taking as good a picture, if not better than my phone does. I mean, the colors and everything, being able to tell, you know, a summer coat on a deer to a winter coat. I mean, just being able to see the difference in every different aspect of just the color platform of it was just ridiculous. Okay, comparing it to an iPhone camera might be reaching. Yeah, a little bit, but, you know, trying to give some kind of example of how I saw it. The photos are, there are some downfalls to the photos. Um, The night photos aren't that great. Um, The daytime photos are decent when everything is in the right lighting. So, like, if you have a deer then there's like kind of an overcast or whatnot the pictures are pretty good with the overcast but if the sun is in the area i saw that you know it kind of distorts the picture a little bit but what do you expect for 25 dollars? like i mean you're not going to get a crisp you know dslr type photo for 25 dollars. the other thing we ran into too is we didn't we did set some cameras up where they literally caught either the sunrise coming up or they caught the sun going down so i mean there was several cameras that we had where it was just hours of just sun glaring right at the lens so if the grass moved and tripped the sensor i mean all you got was just the glowing sun yeah joshua joshua also uh set up a camera on like a twig one time and that's the time that we got the sixteen thousand pictures josh was like yeah man i got it set up on this little cluster of trees you know i did well i wasn't there so i was like okay yeah sounds good man and then he hit me up he was like dude i got sixteen thousand pictures i was like of what <laughs> Like, what the fuck did you get 16,000 pictures of? We thought we had it braced pretty good. Again, it was a smaller, I would say, some people call them saplings, you know. It's probably about a five and a half foot, six foot tall oak tree with probably about a three, four inch diameter on the trunk of it. And we were trying to position the camera to where it'd sit up at an angle where you could see stuff and not point straight at the ground. And apparently, you know, Oklahoma's known for being, you know, just the bipolar state when it comes to weather, so... We had one of those really strong, gusty wind weeks where apparently it moved it enough, not being as sturdy of a tree as the rest of the more mature oaks and stuff. And the little twig that my dad and I had shoved up in there to kind of angle it up apparently fell. And with the strap being somewhat just a hair loose, tripped the sensor quite a bit more. And we caught quite a bit of grass moving. Still caught deer and other critters, but I would say only probably about... 1,500 to 2,000 pictures were of actual critters, and the other 14 and a half, 15,000 were definitely of um, the same, probably 100 great blades of grass moving. Yeah, and I do believe that some of those pictures, you know, he said 1,500, you know, I think most of those were pictures of deer feet, or like, you know, I think there was a couple raccoons on there too. There were. But, you know, overall, they are a great camera for $25, and they work great for $25. Like, that's what you got to keep in mind. You know, you're not spending $100. You're not spending $200. You're not spending $80. 
you know, what is it? I think we have like $33 with the SD card and the set of batteries in a camera setup. So if that gets stolen, I mean, yeah, that sucks, but $33. Yeah, $33 versus a couple hundred. So when I go and set these up on public land anyways, I'm kind of like um, paranoid all the time because I'm afraid that they're going to get stolen. Someone's going to stumble across this and it's going to get stolen. But also, I hunt in I hunt in these areas that are very secluded or hard to get to because that's normally where the deer and uh, the hogs, when I'm chasing those, are. So what I'll do is I'll take my climber in with me and I will find a tree that I can climb, you know, 10, 15 feet up in, and I'll angle the cameras down. And surprisingly, on one setup that I did this summer, I uh, angled the camera down. I probably climbed 20 feet up in this tree, which I didn't think that the camera would actually reach that far. But when I flipped it into aim mode and had my little brother walk around, it was activated. You know, he was, you know, at least 30 yards away. And, you know, it took decent pictures of a, you know, pretty vast area. So if the deer came in, let's say, let's say it was a 75 yard area. It's 20, 20 feet up in the tree angled down. So I'm getting pictures of a 75 yard area that has three trails in it. So anytime something triggers in that area, I was getting pictures. So it, it actually ended up being a pretty cool setup. Yeah, you're talking about the range on them and stuff. And you, that one camera we set up kind of on the edge of the field when the beans were still up. You know, yeah, even though we weren't getting the best quality picture all the time at night, like you said, but you could tell it was picking up deer that were easily 50 to 70 yards out in the field. You could just see a barely of a silhouette, you know, out there, but you couldn't clarify whether it was doe or buck or how big it was, but it did pick something up out that far, so... Yeah, but I think a lot of those times it was something else that was ended up triggering the triggering the camera. I don't think it was actually the deer triggering the camera at 75 yards. I think it was like maybe there was a deer that walked by and then just, you know, it happened to, you know, get that deer out there. Or like maybe the wind blew a little bit and there just happened to be a deer in that field. Because at night, you know, that field fills up pretty fast with deer. Yeah, I mean, for sure. I mean, there's been several times we've been out there looking at pictures and stuff and looking at foot tracks and you get back and pull out the card and you look up and there's any time there could be 20 30 deer just in front of the camera at one point especially at night yeah but with that being said overall we've been really impressed with you know just the camera itself overall setup easy you know battery life being phenomenal for us and just the affordability phenomenal dude i think this camera makes batteries or something like, what's it do? Is it got a little solar panel in there? Something's going on. It's got the little Keebler elves working on. So with this. that being said, let's move forward in. I want to talk a little bit about camera setup. So like, not necessarily trail camera, but I want to talk about like video cameras. So what we're going to be doing this year, since this will be the first year that we're really actually like focusing a lot on uh, videos. Um, I'm, I've bought recently, I bought a DSLR. I'm looking into a Canon uh, G20 or a Vixia. And, you know, it's just a little bit of money, but I hope you guys will uh, stay tuned this this deer season and throughout the, the summer because we're going to be posting up a lot of video content and more of these Land BS podcasts. We'll be posting up, uh, you know, just me and Josh goofing off or uh, things that we're doing. I'll be doing a lot of fishing this summer, I hope, and uh, I'll probably be posting up a bunch of content about that. You know, me and Josh really started this this series of the podcast because, you know, we were kind of talking one night and we decided, you know, hey, let's just do a podcast, a couple of little episodes here and there about the land and things that we have planned. But it's also so you guys have something to relate with. You know, we do everything on a budget because, uh, you know, we're everyday people. We're normal guys and, you know, we're not rich. We're not, you know, sponsored by everybody in the world and uh, we don't get everything given to us. So what we have to do is... You know, do things on a budget. So these Tasco cameras, we're telling you guys about them because we believe in this product. And we hope you guys, if you are looking for a good budget camera or even just like a public land camera or whatever, you guys can pick one of these up for pretty cheap and it's a good, reliable camera. Yeah, and with that being said, you know, we'll be sure to stay tuned to the YouTube channel especially as we'll be posting up, you know, more videos of, you know, things we're doing out there at the land, whether it's, you know, food plots, you know, tree trimmings, setting up stands and blinds, or even getting mineral sites and cameras set up. We'll even be testing products and, you know, posting up videos of hunts and mainly with the product, you know, testing just to see, you know, if we can help find 
something more cost effective, you know, for the everyday hunter and be able to help you guys out on future hunts. Yeah. So, uh, next week on the devoted outdoorsman, this, the regular podcast guys, um, I'm going to be, I guess it might not be next week. It might be like two weeks from now, which right now, what is today? Today is today's the 23rd. Today is, what is it? Feb- March 23rd. Yeah. <laughs> we don't know what day it is. <laughs> that's bad, dude. Tell That tells you how normal our jobs are. Yeah. We got deer on our brain right now. It's okay. So it's March 23rd, and uh, we're going to have a guy on. Speaking of public land cameras, that's what brought this into my head. It's called um, the Crossbow Diffuser. That's the brand, but they have this cool little device that, like, um, it's a magnet, and you, like, mounts to the back of your trail camera. It's, like, a really strong magnet. And it, there's two of them. So, like, you know when you stick a magnet together, it, it, it attracts. So what happens is one of these magnets mounts to the back of your trail camera. And then it has, like, this little prong that comes off that sticks on this rod. And then on the other side, the other magnet, it, you screw this magnet into the tree with this rod. It's got, like, a, a Torx bit on the end of it. And you screw this into the tree. Like, so if you want to go to public land and you don't want to carry your... Uh, your uh, climber in or a ladder or some stack of sticks or whatever you can just take this tool in there and you take this rod and you stick it into the tree and you screw the spike in you know with the magnet on it and then you take your trail camera you stick the other magnet on there with the strap you set your camera and you use the rod to set it up there on the magnet so now you know it's you can have a camera up in a tree super fast you know especially if you have like magnets that are already set up somewhere so I thought that was a pretty cool, you know, thing that they had going on there. Uh, I actually don't remember where I found that at. I think it was on Facebook, but um, it might not have been Facebook. I think, yeah, I think it was on Facebook. But um, I thought it was pretty cool, so I reached out to them the other day, and uh, they hit me up, and we're gonna do a little podcast about that. So make sure to stay tuned for that and uh, listen to that podcast because they seem pretty cool, and um, you guys should definitely check out that product. That would be really beneficial, thinking about it. I mean, one, you get it up out of arm's reach, and two, it, if they do end up getting up to it, it ain't going to be easy to pull it off of there. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> you know, that's just like something that someone was thinking out of the box, and I thought it was really cool. It's just one of those little uh, unique setups that someone thought of, and uh, I was just like, man, that's really awesome, and that could come in handy so many times, which, you know, I use my climber, and it doesn't take me very long at all. As long as I have a good straight tree, I can be up at fast but you know if for those areas like a lot of public land is you know you can't always find that perfect straight tree to climb up in so you know for that with that you know you can get like i think it extends i think the bar extends i don't really know how far it extends though i, th- I want to say it was like 12 feet so you could get a your camera 12 feet up in the tree that's well out of you know eyesight because that's my main concern when i'm setting up cameras on public land is eyesight i want it to be up above where people are looking especially in like um after the leaves fall off the trees in the fall or in the winter because It's real easy to spot a camera that is, you know, waist high or, you know, a couple feet off the ground, especially when there's no leaves or anything on the tree. You're just cruising through there. You see that, you know, I'm not going to steal something, but, you know, a lot of those people, a lot of people will. And, you know, as much as that, you know, just it gets under my skin that people do that. Every time I see somebody's trail camera out in the woods, you know, this is kind of a funny thing that I do, especially on public land. Um, so, like, if I'm just cruising through public land, scouting a new area or whatever, and all of a sudden I see somebody's trail camera, if I'm already in the range of view to it, I go and give it a thumbs up, and then I walk off. Because I want them to know, if they ever see me, that I'm not somebody that's going to steal their stuff. And, you know, that makes me, you know, kind of, like, extends it. It's like a handshake. It's like saying, I caught you, but I'm not going to mess with it. Yeah, I'm not going to mess with it. That way they know, you know, hey, man, I saw your camera, but I'm not going to steal it. Because... Lots of people get their stuff stolen on public land and even on private land every year. And that's just something that pisses me off. Well, yeah, I mean, you talk about going on there and, you know, trying to set it up to where they, you know, see that you're not going to take it. And if they see you out there, you know, don't worry about me. I'm not going to mess with it. I mean, you look at it, it's public land. Everyone owns it. We all get to hunt it. And for some people, it's the only place that can go hunt. So, you know, some people are putting a lot of risk into putting a camera up out there and being able to see people out there. Like, you know, going under and thumbs up saying, hey, I, I'm on your camera, but I'm not messing with it or whatever. You know, kind of just gives them a reassurance and makes them feel more comfortable going back out there. Also, I think that it kind of puts out like a, 
you know, a reassurance that maybe not, maybe if they run into my camera, they won't steal it. And, you know, a lot of times my cameras, like I said, are out of reach for people. And I make, I try to make it pretty difficult to find. Shoot, half the time you gotta be a freaking monkey to get to your cameras. Well, you know, I don't want them to get stolen, man. I gotta look out for what's mine. That's true. And sometimes I got some pretty cool pictures out on public land, you know, like this year. So, uh, actually, you know, to bring it back to last week, we were talking about how uh, you shot your uh, first deer with your bow this or last, this year. So, or I guess last year since it's 2018 now. Yeah. So 2017, Josh shot his first deer with a bow on, out on this public land. And uh, when the river got up real high and I couldn't get it, or the creek got up real high and I couldn't get across, one day, you know, I was just like, I was just like, man, I got to set this camera up somewhere. I just want to know what's happening in this area just to kind of see what's going on. And I know there's a lot of hogs in the area. So, I mean, I'm not really, you know, if you want to find a hog, it's not very hard. You can go find some hogs, but deer are what I'm trying to pattern. And so over this pond where I'd seen that a lot of deer and hogs had been crossing at, I set this camera up in this tree, which was right in the trail. Like, I mean, it's right on the trail. Like people walk in to go down to this creek to fish. And if you're walking this trail, you would walk right past my camera. And, you know, at first I was really worried that someone was going to walk past it and end up stealing it. And what was funny about it is I set it up and it sat there for two weeks. I got lots of pictures of raccoons coyotes hogs no deer no people so it was just like you know i guess no one decided to go fishing that week apparently <laughs> but uh that one was like right on top i was just a real fast setup i was just like you know if i'm lucky no one will steal it so i just set it up right there dude like somebody could have walked by and seen it and uh no one ended up stealing it another weird thing that happened to me two years ago on some public land was I found, like, one morning, I parked in the same parking area every morning. I get there before everybody else does. That way I can get in and they can push the deer to me. And I got, I pulled into my spot. And as I pulled into my spot, I saw a flash. And I was like, "Mm, that's weird. Like, maybe, you know, maybe it was just me. So I asked my dad about it. He's like, yeah, you know, I saw that too. I was like, okay, what was that? So I back up, you know, I park my park my Tahoe and everything, and I get out, the t- when I open the door, I see another flash, and I'm like, dude, that somebody's taking pictures of us, and my dad's like, what are you talking about, I was like, dude, did you see that flash, someone's taking pictures of us, my dad kind of brushed it off, and then I got, I, I took a couple steps, and there was another flash, my dad's like, all right, I saw it that time, what's going on, so I started investigating a little bit, and uh, someone had hung a trail camera, I mean, not, not secured at all, just hung a trail camera in that parking area, in the, like, right on the parking lot. And I know it wasn't there the night I left, the night before when I left, because I checked. Like I had, I parked right there in the same spot. Like it was not there. And then the next morning, someone was there. So that means in the middle of the night, at some point, someone went and hung a trail camera right there in that parking lot. That's um, that's a unique spot to hang a camera. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, dude, I'm not really sure. I think they were hunting. Unless they're hunting like our old lease, you know, where they the deer walk right through the parking area. Maybe. Or another thing I thought of is maybe they were seeing if people were, were uh, hunting that area. Is like maybe they were sitting it there. But at the same time, why would they do that at night? It's kind of a sketchy deal right there. Yeah, and also you know I uh, used the restroom right in front of it, so they might have got some pictures that they didn't want to see. You didn't happen to see any smoke coming out of a stack somewhere in the ground, did you? No, man. It was a, it was a, it was an ordeal, man. I, I asked my dad. My dad was like, "Man, what do we do?" And I was like, "I don't know. Leave it there." And we can do. So this is the weird part about it, right? It was like four thirty in the morning when we went in, and when we came out at uh, twelve thirty, when we came back out, it was gone. So somebody set it up at night. They came back in the middle of the day to get it. My dad has this whole theory that it was a game warden trying to see if people were. Uh, um, poaching out there but I mean I guess I could see that I mean there's a lot of that going on also there's a lot of people uh, hunting with dogs out there for hogs and uh, you know that leads to other other quarry being trapped as well sometimes so I think that really was probably a, a game warden or something doing a little bit of a investigating but uh, it was just a weird situation that a I kind of recon little recon part. yeah I kind of forgot about it until just a moment ago so I hope you guys enjoyed this episode of the Land BS podcast. Um, I hope you guys will st- uh, tune in next week for another episode. I think me and Josh are going to do one. I'm not really sure what it's going to be on yet, but there will definitely be another episode of the Land BS series next week. Also, tune in Saturday. Every Saturday, I upload a podcast 
for the devoted outdoorsmen. A lot of times they're interviews with other hunters, stuff like that. And if you will take a minute out of your day to go and like the Facebook page and subscribe to the YouTube channel, that would be awesome. And it helps us out a lot. That's the Devoted Outdoorsman on Facebook and on YouTube. With that being said, I hope you guys have an awesome week and dream a lot about giant bucks. So, the Devoted Outdoorsman logging out.